Hello video people, this is uh, very exciting for you today. Normally I start with the audio, um, but today I didn't and you get to see how it all comes together, which will be really exciting. Exciting, right? Alright, so uh, today we're going to do the last lecture before our midterm on Samuel Taylor Coolidge, Coolidge and let's go. So, good place to start. Seems like the start of his life. Um, and think like it helps if you think of Coolidge like in the following way. Someone said in my one class, they said, uh, they described on their homework uh, that you had to do because you were talking while you were supposed to be reading. Um, they described Wordsworth as someone who was like obviously like troubled and dark. Um, but who had like an appeal to him. He was alluring. He's like the, you could think of Wordsworth as being, and I, and I agree, like he was always like searching for himself. So he wasn't like maybe the healthiest. He wasn't the lustiest of drovers, but he still had like some appeal to him. Um, so he's like that, um, like the dark, mysterious, bad um, person that you, shouldn't be attracted to because you know like it's not going to be a healthy relationship but you can't help yourself that's who Wordsworth is. Uh, Coolridge is just he's tortured too um, but in a way that's like sad um, it's not really like appealing or alluring um, you would feel bad like if you went to a bar with uh, Coolridge or a not a bar a restaurant with Coolridge um, you would not leave thinking like, oh, I wonder if he's dating someone. You would leave thinking, like, is he going to be okay by himself? Does he need to go somewhere for, like, the holidays? Does he have anywhere to go? Like, you would be concerned about him uh, rather than attracted to him. So I think that that's, like, a key difference between the two poets. Uh, so his early life, he was described as being dreamy. He suffered um, some physical um, health ailments when he was growing up. So he wasn't like, I said, he wasn't a lusty drover. He l didn't really care for traditionally, you know, masculine male activities. Like he wasn't into sports. He liked to hang out in nature and he liked to read. He was very religious. His father was a member of the clergy, so they grew up with religion. Um, he, some of you can relate to that, right? Having a family member that's a, that's a preacher, member of the clergy. Uh, I would just say this on an unrelated note to that, uh, Coolridge never broke my speaker, so I think that's a difference he has with some of you who may have just related to him. Moving on. Um, so Coolridge was, like, really liked reading all sorts of stories. Um, he was influenced by religion, but he just didn't quite fit in. Um, and he suffered a lot of tragedy too, starting from the time he was a small boy. Uh, he loved his father, he really idolized him, and he died when he was, when Coolridge was eight. Um, after the death of his father, he was shipped off to uh, like a, sort of like a charity school. Children who were poor, orphaned, um, could attend school, and he had uh, brothers and sisters and just his mom at that time so um, she shipped him off to this boarding school and like I said he really loved his father but he had a trickier relationship with his mother because and this is where you're gonna start feeling bad for him um, so th there's this boy and he has these health ailments he's sickly um, he's not like physically strong he has uh, I think he suffered from rheumatoid arthritis um, and he's just lost his father and he shipped off to this boarding school and one of the main problems he had, he did really well in school, he was really smart um, and it was a religious school, I don't know if I mentioned that, so the school was religious. Um, one of the main problems he had was he would get, like, suffer from extreme loneliness because he wanted to come home but he wasn't allowed to visit um, his mother and his brothers and sisters as often as he wanted. Um, and I think that's like sort of why he developed that tricky relationship he had with his mother. I think he blamed her. Um, so that's like he's isolated and he's lonely um, and he's suffering from loss. 
Uh, and we will kind of come back to some of those themes later, but that's that's him in his an early ch child as a as a teenager, as a child to a teenager, uh, and then he goes to take a minute to appreciate the photoshopping here. Uh, then he goes to college. He goes to Cambridge um, on a religious scholarship to study religion. Um, and he's really influent. He was uh, his father was Anglican, so that's if you know a lot about religions, that's fine. Just know it's like uh, sort of like Catholicism. Um, so that's what he's grown up with. Um, he gets to college and he's influenced by more Unitarian beliefs, which is a more I guess you could say liberal form of religion. Uh, there's no real unifying beliefs except for um, the denial of the Trinity. So that's not something that they practice in uh, Unitarian churches. Uh, and he starts talking to people in college and he gets really influenced um, by these beliefs. Now, I don't know what happened exactly when he was in college, but he's just, you have to remember, he's troubled. He's just a troubled person. Um, so some people think it's because he went into debt and he didn't have money to pay for any more college. Um, some people think it was because he was reacting to having, having his heart broken. Because uh, he's like a poet, so he would take that very seriously. He's a dreamy poet, so that would be, he would be very emo about that. Um, but he like goes, in the, in the middle of college, he goes and enlists in the military, um, which did not go well. He was, one of his um, brothers bailed him out later for, like, I think he wasn't in there for a very long year or so, for reasons of insanity. And he went back to college, but he did not finish. So now I'm going to kind of go back a little bit and talk to you about his religious beliefs and how they evolved. Um, so another thing he did when he was in college is he went to Germany to study religion. So at first, so he's becoming like a little bit more liberal or his religious beliefs are a little bit more influenced by Unitarianism. And then he goes to Germany. I don't actually know, like in terms of when he like joined the army, I don't know where Germany fit into the army. His college life was stressful. He had a stressful college life. Um, but at some point, he goes to Germany uh, to study scripture, religion. And when he comes back, he's uh, not a Unitarian anymore. In fact, the Trinity is uh, really important to him. And he believes in key, key themes of Christianity, um, particularly a really important theme to his life and maybe... I don't know if you could see it in Kublai Khan, but in his work is um, renewal, like the renewal of spirit. So he becomes, I don't know if he considered himself an Anglican, I don't know if he had a label for it, but um, I guess his religious beliefs became a little bit more traditional then because he um, thought that the death of Christ and renewal of spirit were the most important themes in religion. All right, um, so he tries some other schemes. He was going to start this. So after college, he, he quits college. He doesn't finish, and he was going to develop this ideal utopian society in Pennsylvania called the Pantisocracy, which is weird. Um, but that, like, doesn't happen. So eventually he ends up, um, he's lecturing above corn stores. We know that. He's doing some lectures. And he befriends Wordsworth, and the most um, like important part of his career happens when he moves out to this cottage, and it's near Wordsworth. Uh, and this is actually, you can still, if you want to, this could be a fun spring or summer break for you, you can go to England and you can stay in the Coolridge Cottage. This is actually... The, um, this scenery here, if you're watching the video, is actually a picture I got from the website. If you want to stay in his in his cottage, this is the countryside. Uh, he's not here. This is Wordsworth, by the way. This is uh, Coolridge, and this is Wordsworth. Um, so he's uh, out in the country, and he uh, writes a lot of his most successful works. He collaborates with Wordsworth out here. Um, it's c kind of good... But there's, like, the thing I remembered about Coleridge, I didn't remember any of this stuff. I remembered the first two lines of 
um, Kublai Khan, because you have to remember them. And that's all I remembered, except for this last thing I'm going to share, uh, which is his opium addiction. I didn't think it was respectful to, like, put him in his college shirt with, like, opium by it, because it was actually a really, um, like, painful addiction, and he didn't like it, and it caused him a lot of misery and suffering in his life. So he, like I said, he had a lot of uh, health issues when he was a kid, and uh, opium in... Um, a really diluted liquid form. It was mixed with like alcohol or something. I'm not exactly sure. It was called laudanum. That was um, prescribed a lot and it was supposed to be, the levels of opium were supposed to be um, really low and it wasn't supposed to be like volatile or cause hallucinations or anything. Um, and he got prescribed that for legitimate like m medical uh, issues that he had. But like I said, it, you weren't supposed to get addicted to it, but because his health was so bad, he got prescribed it a lot. So you have someone who was prescribed this a lot as a child, then they're dealing with like intense feelings of loss, uh, loneliness, um, that, you know, I think like all through college, he was still suffering in the same way. Um, and so the addiction just grew, and he used it for most of his life not I mean I don't know when he started actually using opium and it's he tried to keep it hidden so it's very difficult for like scholars to pinpoint when his opium addiction started um but he used it for most of his uh at least his adult life and up until his death he was kind of um like kind of sober I think or he at least had decreased his use before he died but the relationship of opium to his works is, I think, worth pointing out. Like, Kublai Khan was a work that he made inspired by the opium high or low that he had. Um, and so even though, like, he hated the addiction and it made him really tired and, you know, like, miserable, uh, it kind of also, you know, helped him write. And he would kind of, he, he was known for writing in like short intense bursts of energy um, so and a lot of his writing was fueled by his drug use so it was like a, like maybe a double-edged sword um, for him but that's what everyone wants to know about Coleridge he's he's the guy that did opium but he also um, it's not just that he's a lot more uh, along with Wordsworth kind of started the romantic age of poetry so you can think of like Blake is being, like, right before kind of the tipping point for the Romantic Age, and then um, Coolridge and Wordsworth is being, they're often considered, like, the real founders of the movement. Uh, he was a scholar. He lectured on corn stores, and he did opium. He was many things, okay? Uh, so that's all we really need to know about him. He has some works in lyrical ballads, like Wordsworth, um, but not as many as Wordsworth has. So, he did opium. You'll remember that about him. But he also was very intelligent and a good poet, too. So remember that. All right? Is that good? Is that okay? So, I'll see you in class, and we'll go over midterm stuff.